put on um, sort of our last Zoom for sort of this little period. Hope to resume them, or we will resume them a little bit later in the year. Um, so thank you if you've been a, a regular or if it's your first time, much appreciated. A few topics that we're going to cover off tonight are probably a, come from a discussion that the three of us have had over the last month of just some different topics that have popped up, whether it be from returning to play, whether it be some observations that we've had from watching um, our, our rosters, our rep rosters. Uh, so we've put some thoughts together around some things that we might, <clears throat> might be able to, to fix going forward or just share our thoughts um, to, to stimulate some thought from your end or some debate uh, or some questions even. Um, so hopefully we can shed some light on some stuff here. First topic was, because we put so much time into the return to play coming out of COVID, I felt like um, overall, the majority of athletes have done a really, really good job. Like it's been a very difficult time. I know Victoria's had some real challenges. Um, and speaking to Darren Best at, at his club, um, obviously being here and understanding what we're doing and what we've done and then what they're going through in Melbourne, um, like very, very difficult. So I've been really pleased on our end of how the kids have come back. We should be all really proud of them because it's been really tough. But part of, part of our um, starting play, again, was injuries and our, our worry about kids coming back from doing very little or, or doing a lot of their activity on grass uh, and then coming back and getting on court. And we certainly, not straight away, but we've certainly seen an increase in the amount of injuries upon return to play, um, more than normal. So we just want to continue to emphasise, you know, the functional movement video that we've put out, that you have good warm-ups. And even if you're not doing functional movement, that you have good progression from a slow build up at the start of practice, right, before you get right into, you know, the, the core of your practice. I think that's um, important. The other part now is because we've had a number of injuries is the mistake of athletes coming back too quickly. And as coaches, we really need to be aware. We've got to do a, a good job of being across a it um, with the athletes and making sure that from injury, there's a gradual progression back. There's a, a build-up uh, that's needed through load management and it needs to be adhered to. Um, we can't have athletes that are having four or five weeks off and then they haven't really done any activity of um, load or, you know, pounding the boards and they come back in and they might have one training session and they think they're good to go. You know, if they have a significant amount of time off, all right, then there needs to be that gradual progression need to talk to the kids about being smart and mature and having a conservative approach uh, because we really haven't done any sort of pre-season to begin this season. Um, in my first, in my, in my seven years, it's the first time that I've known athletes to have sort of a bulk of shin splints. Uh, it hasn't been a common um, injury that I've, that I've come across uh, in my time. Um, so I think we really need to be aware of that on the return to play, the different surfaces, um, and probably making sure if it is shin splints, if people have had that, that they get a diagnosis, because that can be a range of different things, right, with the lower legs. Um, speaking to a physio today, it could be any one of three or four things, and I'm not going to go into that, because that's not my area of expertise. But I think we just need to be careful what's getting towards the back end of in finals, um, and obviously some of the older athletes will be playing state league that we, we all will manage or coach. And we just need to be careful that we, one, get professional advice. And then if you get advice, um, then you listen to it and then adhere to it. There's nothing worse, especially from the younger athletes side, that we try and cram work in, try and get back too quick. And then on this back part of the year where we're going to start state trials or development program trials or kids that are going, want to go off to national campaigns that we haven't got their interests at heart and we're trying to rush them back too quickly. And that's on all of us. And, you know, a perfect example here in the Northwest is Ruby Gray, who's had, she's had shin splints and it's been out for four weeks. Taya Webb's had a back problem, been out for four weeks. And their first 
uh, two weeks worth 30 minute sessions and make it a gradual progression. Um, and just make sure that we have those athletes interests at heart. Uh, Nick or Nate, I don't know whether you've got any other examples. They're two good ones for, for us from a junior perspective. Um, but let's not let results get in the way, especially with this short prep and short season, results get in the way of wanting to rush an athlete back. I think we need to be careful of that and, and be responsible from that standpoint. So wanted to flag that. Uh, Nick and Nate, I don't know whether you want to jump in on any of yeah. that. Yeah, I guess for me to kind of add to what you've said there, um, in the South we've had a lot of injuries and I'd probably say more than the other two regions, like most most groups. Yeah, I've got multiple athletes that are out um, yeah, for basically every age group. And I think a really good way is, as coaches for us to approach injuries and we almost have to really sell to the athletes what their mindset needs to be when they have an injury that yep they're injured like mark said you need to follow your know, professional advice and whatever that advice is you gotta follow that but also how you approach it mentally we can do a better job of, of educating the athletes there so yep you're injured let's say you're out for another three four weeks obviously you know emphasize empathize with the athletes that that's you know, not a good thing um but get them to understand that there's an opportunity within the injury and, and i know you i've heard you say before mark that whenever you get injured you should come back better at something so if you've injured your right hand your right handed player well that's great because you can come back and can be better at dribbling and passing and shooting within non-preferred hand and as well for and it's something I, I spoke to my stp athletes about tonight just we've got a fair few under 18 athletes who yeah, are injured and they some that, like Luke Brown as an example, uh, and Lewis Crennan as an example, they could do kind of the first 30 minutes of practice tonight when it was all school stuff. But as soon as it got to competitive play, they had to taper off and they couldn't really participate. So sold to them what their mindset needs to be that this is a great chance for them to work on their leadership and helping out the younger guys and really driving the intensity and the energy of the session through that talk and almost coaching so I think that's maybe uh, something to add for coaches to, to consider how they can talk to the athletes about yeah, their mindset and how they approach being injured. Yeah, another, another example that springs to mind uh, is Lockie Brewer. And he's, he broke his hand uh, pre, pre the break. Um, we, we were focused on his shooting technique uh, and not having a little bit of thumb involvement in his shooting technique. And he actually broke his guide hand and he's come back and his thumb is definitely not in the way anymore because he's just done so much shooting technique with, with his right hand and been able to catch uh, basically with his, um, with his cast on, but he can't use that hand. And I saw him shooting the other night and he's actually fixed his shot by being injured. So there is some good things that can come out of um, injury, as Nick said, and he's, a, he's another example of that. So... Um, again, if you have any questions or anything that you want to share that you may have come across, you know, feel free. We, we want to share any good information that we can, we can to all our um, constituents. The next subject that we had on, um, it was actually one that was sent in to us, that teams that are either a dom dominant team or are being blown out by another team. Um, and I'll jump, uh, jump over to Nick to be able to lead this one and some things that that we'll share with you to maybe help that scenario. Yeah, so I think this is something that it happens everywhere and it's not just in the South, it's not just in Tassie. It's something, and I, I, with this, I look back to my experiences back when I was in, um, back in Cairns and when I was coaching a rep team myself and I was really fortunate we had a really, really strong group and coming through we would win under 14s, under 16s, like our closest game would have been 40, 50 points. And this is, you know, representative games against Townsville, Mackay, even at state championships, we had a lot of games which were like that. So I think I'm kind of fortunate of being in a similar situation to what maybe some of the, the club coaches are, where that's going to happen sometimes, where you're going to have either a really dominant team that, yeah, 
can win pretty comfortably or obviously sometimes it can be the other way around and you know um, you can be you know blown out but I think it's really important as coaches there's obviously it's, it's challenging and if anything I found it in the kind of four years that it was the case for me really challenging because what you have to do as a coach is find a way to keep your athletes humble keep them focused on what they can control and continue to find ways for them to challenge themselves and get something out of the games. So kind of a couple of things that I found really useful with my team back when we we were in that situation was, again, talking to the athletes about their mindset and particularly towards practice. And the way I really sold it to the athletes was your practice sessions that sometimes they're going to be the best competition you're going to get. So really spoke to them a lot about when we're at practice, when we're doing anything competitive, whether it's three on three, four on four, five on five, that they are going at each other as hard as they possibly can. So I think that was one thing really emphasizing practice and, and how that can be utilized. And as far as when it comes to the game itself, some things that I found useful and and again, it's, none of this is easy. And some of these strategies that I'll come up with, they're not perfect. And I think with any part of coaching, it's you try it and it might work for your team and that's great. And if it doesn't, or well, you've, you've experimented, you've tried and then you can move on to something else. So some things I've tried in games, just continue to challenge the athletes to really execute out of timeouts. So you draw up a play on the board, but this is what we got to get done the very next possession. And you hold them super accountable to getting that done. So whatever you draw in a huddle, like that's got to be, you got to nail it. And depending on the level of the athletes, you can just continue to make that more and more advanced in your huddles. So you can give them various different actions. You can you know, emphasize getting the ball from the second side to the third side to sometimes even the fourth side. And you can have yeah, various things that they have to get done, but really challenge the athletes that way to execute out of timeouts. The other way of doing it is challenging the athletes defensively to be able to quickly change defenses. As an example, sorry, you there, Sam, sorry. Um, so uh, as an example, when I was coaching under 16s, and again, we you know, would win a lot of games quite comfortably, we'd talk to them about, okay, um, on made free throws, we're gonna be in a full court press. On made baskets or missed baskets, we're gonna be, you know, wherever our detrans rules are, let's say it's tagging up, we're gonna be tagging up, and then we're gonna be in this particular type of defense. If the ball goes out of bounds in the front court, so out of bounds, then we're going to this type of zone defense. So the athletes have to be switched on because they're going to think there's three different types of defenses that are all situational that they have to be able to execute. So it doesn't matter what the score is, that's a challenge in itself. Of like, okay, made free throw won't this. And it forces the athletes to have to communicate. Um, so that was that was something that I found yeah, really beneficial. Uh, was challenging them there from, from that point of view. With your own, you know, your younger age groups, whether it's under 12s, under 14s, you know, various different things and really basic things that I'm sure some of you have tried is, you know, maybe put it, there must be a certain amount of passes that are thrown before you're allowed to score, or maybe you need to execute a certain type of action before you're allowed to score, whether it's, you know, a drag screen or a handoff or, you know, maybe for if you have a really, really dominant player in under 12s and you're winning very comfortably, or maybe it's to that player, they can only finish with that non preferred hand. So I think as coaches, I guess the key message here is, is think about ways that you can, I guess, mentally challenge the athletes to force them to be switched on and, and, and execute whatever it is you talk about, you know, pre-game or, or in your huddle. Anything? To add there, Mark or Nate? Yeah, um, I had a couple of things that I I thought would be beneficial, especially if you're down. Um, pick 
one or two habits and really just focus in on them. I think trying to fix everything becomes, you know, trying to plug a hole in a bucket and then another hole comes and you're trying to plug that. I think just find one or two habits that you got to focus on each week for that game and just coach that. I think when you start chopping and changing what your focus is, I think it becomes difficult for the athletes and then probably difficult for you to hold people accountable to as well. So just narrow your focus down. A couple of habits, it might be calling ball, carrying a hand. It might be, you know, let's make sure that we've got our help defence right and just focus on that. It, it might be just let's make sure we use pass fakes and pivots. Whatever it m- might be that the habit that you want to coach, just stay on that and so you can assess that at the end of the game. Um, and I would say the same if you're up. You know, challenge, challenge your players on, on certain habits. All right, because that's what you're trying to build for the long term. Yeah, just to add to that, I think in summary, you basically it needs to be process driven rather than result driven. Whatever you do, if you're down or up, it, it's got to be process driven. And one thing to take note of, if you are up and up significantly, just be mindful of being respectful to the opposition, particularly regarding timeouts late, and try to avoid using timeouts with a couple of minutes to go into fourth quarter up 50. Like it's, it's not a great look and it's not a great feeling for the opposition coach or team to have that happen against you. And we have witnessed that a couple of times this year. Um, I have witnessed it where the teams are, are down 50 and call a timeout with like 30 seconds to go. And, you know, I'm not sure that there's a play in anyone's play group that's going to give you 50 points off one play. So. Um, that's a great point you make, Nate. Um, with that, Nate, we'll move into our, our next uh, item, which is coming into our off-season. All right, so just being able to cover off on an off-season plan more, more from an individual standpoint. So if you want to just touch on that, Nate. Yeah, no problems. It's probably timely to talk on this, given there's quite a few of the junior rosters coming to a close, particularly in the south and the northwest. So... As coaches, being able to encourage athletes to develop a plan and develop a plan for the off-season to help them improve and get better so they're ready for next year and they're a better basketball player. So obviously, the initial steps in off-season, you want to make sure you rest and recover and also reflect. And it's not something that I'll necessarily touch on now, but in terms of developing a plan, you want to make sure you evaluate yourself and your game prior to developing that plan so what do the players do well what needs improvement and things to look at might be skills athleticism intangibles like what's their basketball iq like their leadership of a good teammate so being able to evaluate those things should help a player determine what areas of their game they need to improve in terms of what I want to touch on briefly today, there's a couple of plans that I'd like to discuss and we think will be beneficial for players to implement over the off season. One being a non-dominant hand plan and the other one is strength and conditioning. So the non-dominant hand plan, it's an opportunity for players of all levels to improve the skill and the use of their non-dominant hand. We listened to a podcast recently Uh, by Damien Lillard's trainer and they talked about how that was an emphasis for his game and his off-season for the last few years and and as a pro skill trainer of NBA guys he said it's one of the biggest things that he thinks coaches at all levels can work on with their players actually developing their non-dominant hand so in terms of developing the non-dominant hand some of the key areas probably to look at would be ball handling finishing and passing So if we look at ball handling for a start, why would we want to do that? Well, we want to make sure we don't let the D dictate where we go on the floor. We want to be a threat to beat the D either way. We want to be difficult to guard. So being able to go either way with the basketball is critical for that. In terms of how you could improve your ball handling with your non-dominant hand, it can be really basic, like just hard pounds into the floor, like hard pounds, high, low, north south east west stationary moving whatever you like right and then you can 
in addition to that, you could add dribble moves such as inside out, hesitations, retreat dribbles. There's a lot of different things that players could do. Some key teaching points would be to ensure that eyes up, you're working, you're pounding the ball as hard and fast as possible and really asking the athletes to, to challenge themselves in that respect. In terms of finishing, you want to, again, be a dynamic player. You, you might only be able to finish on the left-hand side of a basket on a particular play. Um, the angle to score the basketball and not get blocked might only be able to occur if you use your non-dominant hand. So it's pivotal that you've got skills to be able to do that. The ability to finish with your non-dominant hand off of penetration from yourself, from being a receiver around the rim, um, various types of finishes, like it's all important stuff to work on. In terms of what different aspects of this skill and finishing can you do? Layups, and from basic, from regular to reverse, one foot, two foot, drive down the middle, drive down the lane line, drive down the baseline, from each side of the floor, one hand gathers, euro steps, look, it's endless, really, what you could do. And it's, as a player, it's determining what's this, what's your skill set at the moment and what do you need to get better at in terms of your finishing? Like, if you're under 12, it's the basics. You've got to get the basics right. If you're a more senior player, then you can start working on some of these advanced things. But you've got to get the bread and butter down pat first before you move on to these advanced things, especially for the junior junior athletes. So you've got layups, then you've also got your floaters. And so a key teaching point that we talk about for floaters is, is shooting them high and soft. So we aim for swishes with your reps. Hook shots, post moves, runners, all different things you can work on with your non-dominant hand. And the last one I touched on was passing. And so again, angles are really important. You may only have a particular angle to deliver the ball if you use your non-dominant hand. In terms of how you can practice that, like if you have a partner, great. But even just up against a brick wall, just throw up against a brick wall, get the reps with your non-dominant hand, chest passes, bounce passes, one hand dribble off the bounce, different distances, practice post feeds, pick and roll passing, pocket pass, lobs. Like Again, it's endless and all you need is a basketball and a brick wall to work on that. So off-hand development in the off-season, dribbling, finishing and passing. They'd be the three keys that we think we could be really valuable for to players to improve on. Mark and Nick, did you have anything on that before I move to s and I think the only thing I would touch on, Nate, is, and I've talked about it over the last week with the, the Northwest kids, is you only need twice a week 15 minutes. Like, we're not talking about going down to the stadium and putting an hour in every day. You know, everybody can put in two sessions, 15 minutes, on the back of the rest of your session. So you might go to the stadium and we might be at home and you've got to have an hour of some skill development, shooting, finishing. You might just need 15 minutes of a focus of your non-dominant hand. And I think over, over the course of two or three months, you could see a great progression if you're committed to doing that twice a week. Um, so I don't, it's not one of those things that has, has to be laborious and... But it has to be done uh, to make yourself, you know, a better offensive player. And I, I think as well, just a good, good thing to note: if, if you improve your non-dominant hand, even if you don't work on, your, like, let's just say you only, as an example, you only work on your non-dominant hand, you will automatically be better with your dominant hand as a result of that. Because in a game, defense has to, you know, play a bit more straight up. But, you know, just helps keep the defense honest. So then there's going to be more opportunities for you to get to your dominant hand. And if you get better with your non-dominant, then it's going to make yeah, getting to your dominant hand easier, which will make you better with that as well. Yep, spot on. The, uh, another podcast I listened to recently, Rat, was um, Devin Booker's individual trainer, who's now an assistant coach at Memphis um, with Penny Hardaway. and he calls it brushing your teeth and basically he calls everyone wants to have white teeth and he calls brushing your teeth to the athletes for 15 minutes pre or post practice where you get in your work at the basics and your fundamentals 
and you want to be really good at those basics and fundamentals to be a good basketball player, everyone wants to have white teeth. So he calls it brushing your teeth. And she's developing a 15-minute plan for you to do. It doesn't even have to be in the off-season. It could be during the season, before a game, before a practice. It's just to really lock in and have an intentional and focused effort at improving certain aspects of your game. So I really like that term, brush your teeth. That's a great, that's a great term. And another one that the Spurs have used, I know I've heard it in the past through Matt Nielsen, and, and he started at the Perth Wildcats, was um, your daily vitamins. And it was used to be like a 20-minute hit of skill development before you actually went into your training session. So, Yeah, good. So the next one to touch on in terms of off-season plans is our strength and conditioning program and SNC is, is often the separating factor for athletes when going up levels and it can also help with injury prevention so the off season particularly the start of an off season that is the perfect time to increase strength and to address muscle imbalances and it, it really should form the, the foundation of any SNC program the first part of your off season and the other areas regarding S and C um, can follow that, but those first few weeks or however long it is in the off season, if you can really increase your strength and address muscle imbalances, you're putting yourself in a good spot to, to get better athletically. Some areas to consider regarding S and C is strength, uh, quickness, like your first step in, in b ball, agility, the ability to accelerate, decelerate, leaping ability, flexibility, uh, what's your body composition like? Do you need to add more muscle, lose some fat? And conditioning, like are you in fourth quarter basketball shape? Like do you need to be fitter so that you're ready to go in the last two minutes of a big game? Okay, so things to consider for the player. And the great thing about S&C programs in the off season, you don't have to have a gym. Like you can go online and you can access any program right now a body weight program. There's that many online that are free to download. You just find one that's suitable for you and it's something you can do at home. Again, isn't something that needs to take hours every day. Um, it's low cost and it's it's something that if you do a free weight SNC routine, you're not going to be any worse than if you did, didn't do it. Like it's going to improve you. If that's the best you can do because you don't have access to weights, you're going to be better as a result of it. So all athletes should be able to do something in the off season to help make them better. As coaches, it's on us to encourage athletes and to try and persuade and push them towards um, implementing a plan like this. And we can help them with certain aspects of it, but it needs to be athlete driven. We can't drive their um, attention to detail and they're actually completing of the plan. It needs to be driven by the athletes, but we can support that. And so, again, really supporting athletes and encouraging athletes to implement an S&C program over the off-season, I think, is a, is a really good step. Nick and Mark, anything else there? Yeah, I think just to jump in and, I guess, add to that, from my experiences, you know, with the Taipans um, in the NBL, I think, and maybe this is for older athletes who maybe right now they are doing some stuff, is to understand yeah, the current load that they're doing during the season. So as an example, NBA players during the season, they're probably getting in one, you know, one at a, at a minimum, probably two max strength and conditioning sessions in a week. So about one or two when the season's on. Now, like Nate said, once the off season starts, then obviously there's less games and there's less team trainings and all that. So that's, like Nate said, is the perfect time to up that. And pro players in, in the off-season and, and definitely in the pre-season, that's when it's starting to get up to about four times a week strength and conditioning. So I think maybe something for those athletes who are a little bit older, talking to them about, you know, getting them to understand what is their current load with that and where, where there might be an opportunity during the off-season to up that, as well as talking to them about, maybe certain areas that as a coach you've identified that they need to improve. So maybe, you know, maybe they're not strong through the core. Maybe you identify that, uh, that they're not using their legs enough for that jump shot. 
and there can be little things that we can observe observe as coaches and like Nate said it we can't really be the ones giving it to them um, and we can't be the ones driving it but we can definitely help educate them about their load and, and what that should look like as well as, as help them with some various areas that that might be of value to focus on good you have any more there Nate Nah, I'm done. I think the next thing's Nick to discuss reflecting on the season. Yeah, which probably ties in with, you know, coming into developing your plan for the off season is part of reflecting, and you touched on it, Nate, reflect on what, what the athletes individually and you as a coach need to improve on and actually what you did do well. That's always a good thing. You know, talk about as coaches, let's try and find athletes doing the right thing 75% of the time and not just correcting. All right, so that's that's also got to be leading into the off season and what you got to develop your plan around. You want your strength to become your strength. There is obviously we've talked about non-dominant hand plan and improving from that standpoint. But what you're actually good at, you want to make great, all right? Because that's in the end, that's going to be the role on a team that you play, you play with. So over to you, Nick, and and touch on reflection on the season so far, what you've seen. Yeah, so. What I'll do is, I'm actually just going to quickly share my screen. Can, can you see that, Mark? Yep. Yeah, so this is, this is a document that um, I've used personally, myself in the past, and, and something we've spoken about, you know, implementing something like this maybe with our state teams. But this is just a 10-page, which seems like a lot, but it's pretty big font and whatnot. Um, but a 10-page, just a review document that... Um, I've used personally myself kind of at the end of a season. So whether it's, you know, as an example, at the end of the under 14 state championships, we'd fill this out. Um, you could also, and, and for those who, you know, were on my talk uh, a month or so ago, I spoke about, you know, macro plans and micro plans. You could definitely use some of these questions and it doesn't have, have to be necessarily at the end of the season. You could also ask yourself some of these questions maybe um, you know, at the end of a month or uh, after a particular tournament. So I'll just quickly share some of them. Um, and, I, and I think the key with this document, I'm, I'm more than happy to share this document with anyone that, that wants a copy of it. But the, the key thing is, is as a coach, well, when the season finishes, are you reflecting? Are you asking yourself questions? And then I guess the, the, the goal of this document is to help guide you and ask you certain questions to um, get you to think about particular things. So as an example, uh, this is the, just the first page of questions here, just quickly reflect on your team and you know, what were your goals for the season? And then obviously you can go into them and you know, did you achieve them? And then it elaborates that a little bit more. So what do you believe you know, need to be done differently in order to, to reach those? goals and then it talks about so that's I guess more from a team point of view that it talks about you individually as a coach so do you have any individual goals so section there on goals then there's a section on just preparation and you know preparation for the tournaments or games and you know identifying what did you do well as well as you know what are some things that that can be improved this is maybe a little bit more technical and a little bit more detailed, but, you know, opposition teams and reflecting on not just your team, but reflecting on who you play as well. So, you know, outlining maybe who are the, you know, the top teams that you came up against. Then when you play those teams, have a think about, well, what was your prepar preparation like for those games? Um, you know, what went well, what didn't go well, preparing for those opponents. Um, how did your team perform against them? What would have you have liked to have done differently? You know, if you can go back and, and do it again, what would you change? Then it just breaks it down a bit further and very similar questions around opposition players. Then, and I'll, I'll come back to this at the end, um, evaluating your team. So what were your team's strengths? And what Mark spoke about, identifying what your team is good at and what you're good at individually as a coach is really important, so then you can make that good and make it great. Um, then 
a real self evaluation as a coach. So what, you know, what are your strengths as a coach? Um, and then comparing yourself in the right way, comparing yourself to other coaches as well. So, you know, what was, what did, what was different between yourself and some of the other coaches, you know, good and bad, maybe it was how you approach the games, maybe you were a little bit more serious about it. Um, maybe the other coaches maybe had better, uh, strategy in games than you. So just evaluating yourself and thinking about what are some of the key learnings you can get out of, you know, other coaches that you go up against and then thinking about setting some individual goals for yourself. So as a coach, so, you know, one of the three things that you want to work on moving forward and that might tie in with a part of your plan for the next season. So something um, I've said before at Quinix is, as coaches, it's really important that we always challenge ourselves and, and ask ourselves this question. When was the last time you did something for the first time? And I think as, as coaches, we always need to be trying new things and experimenting and adding to our kind of bow of different things that we can do. So um, identifying, you know, what you need to work on. Maybe it might be, you know, zone offense. I need to be better with that. So if you identify that at the start of the off season, then that's, you know, you might have time to invest and learn more about that. So then it can be a part of your plan for the following season. Um, so I'll just quickly, I guess, to kind of conclude this document, this is uh, just a little rating system. And this, what's in this, you can change it to what suits your team, but it's the rating of your team in regards to certain areas offensively and defensively. So, you know, various things about, you know, using ball screens, cutting, um, you know, the playbook, understanding the plays that you try to run and the, and the players understanding why you try to run those plays. So the players understand the, you know, the scout. Um, so just various things there. And things might appear throughout it that, and if this is something you do every season, again, there might be things that appear that maybe your team maybe struggles, maybe they're below average in pace. So if that's a theme that appears, then well, that helps you as a coach understand that, okay, oh, I need to get better at coaching that. And that's going to help me in the off season is I can go work on that and then come back and I can have a plan for that and can be better with that. Then just defensively and, and, I think this is really important. And, and when I consider what I've seen down here, um, I'll just stop sharing. But what I've seen in the, the Southern League games, I would say that's the one area that needs some real addressing is defense and really emphasizing to athletes having good habits of you know, always being in a stance, pressuring the ball, more than anything, just getting after it more defensively. So I think that's, that's definitely something that's really stood out um, for me watching the games. Uh, Mark, do you anything you want to add, add to any of that? Yeah, uh, that, that's a great document, Nick. I think if we just circle back on that, um, I think one way of also not getting to the end of the season and evaluating why you would do that, no question, with, and that's a great guide for your document. When was the also the last time that you had another coach or somebody that, may coach at a different level, um, come in and evaluate your practice session and how you're teaching stuff or what content you have in your practice session. Um, obviously, games can be feedback, but, you know, if you're, if you're not winning games and you're trying to fix things at practice, but maybe you're not teaching stuff, um, whether it's the right way or, not, or you might be giving mixed messages or maybe you can just give it a little clearer. I think we've all been through that stage you finish teaching a drill and you think to yourself, God, I didn't teach that very clearly. That was, you know, bad coaching. And um, when was the last time you had someone come in and evaluate and give you that honest feedback? So you can just constantly have a growth mindset of not, not protecting your training session. You don't want anyone to come in and see it. You know, you might be a little bit shy from that standpoint, but I think just opening yourself up and being vulnerable and saying, come in and tell me the honest truth and how, how can I improve this and get better? And I think that's why I actually love our state camps because it gives me the opportunity to come in. And when I'm coaching on the floor and I'm around um, 
Nate and Nick and Brad when he was here and the other coaches, you know, you can get feedback. What do you think of that drill? How did we teach that? Um, and I crave that feedback from that standpoint because I want to deliver the best training session I can for the kids. And I think being open to that will certainly help you. Um, one, it'll help you coach you, your kids better. But by the time you get to the end of the season, you can start to tick off some things and go, well, I really improved in this area when you're doing your, your evaluation. Um, from a defensive standpoint, that's definitely been a topic uh, for us. And I've made it probably well known from a program standpoint that under 12s and 14s, we don't teach a lot of defense. Um, and it's a philosophy that I've, I've had for seven years and, and I, I will stick with that. It's not that we don't teach it and we don't believe in it. We do. Um, it's a little bit of the philosophy that Barcelona um, have with their juniors that to become good offensively and have offensive skill and understanding the game just takes so much work and so much time that at that young age, we put more time into that. And then as you get into the older age groups, the level of defence starts to pick up anyway to a point. Obviously, it's still got to be coached. Um, but some of the things that I think can really help us all, and, and we emphasise this programming, and I'd love to see it more um, at club basketball. And we're going to do a better job of it as well. You've got to stay on it all the time. Um, is not having individual players where you might think they're the worst defender on your team or just don't understand stuff at this time, to send them back and sit them at the front of the charge circle and tell them to stay there. Especially I've seen it a lot at 12s and 14s that just, it doesn't help the kids. And in the end, it's sort of, it, it stifles their development. Um, and this comes back to whether you're up or down um, in games, your responsibility is to educate players and, and build habits. Um, and have them understand concepts. And I think we can do a much better job of that. Um, I know some of it through this roster could be around prep time and not having enough time to prepare. I do that, but we, we actually want kids to get exposed defensively so you can then teach habits. And if you have them where they just go and sit at the front of the, the charge circle, or they just sprint back on defense and stand in a spot that doesn't help their long-term development. Might help you win a game or two now, but that doesn't help them long term, and it doesn't help, you know, the teams that they're going to go to, you know, on a longer term. Um, some other things that I had was when you do go up age groups too, where an issue of athletes standing off because you think they're going to get blown by, so they're not necessarily just standing at the rim, but they stand off um, their man because they're worried about getting blown by. Well, the issue is as you go up age groups and the kids become more skilled, then they don't know how to pressure the ball. Offensive players be, uh, obviously are more skilled and they can pass it and they can start to shoot the three. All right, so then you've got the coach yelling at players to then close the gap and get it out on them, where six months prior, we've got coaches telling them to stand off because they get blown by. So I think it's... I think it's... Uh, Long-term pain, all right, you're going to have to go through it sometimes to teach the habits that are going to help the kids understand the game all right, for longer term and for them to be able to go up levels. Um, so I think that's, I don't know whether you guys want to add to that a little bit. It's been a red flag for me over the last seven or eight weeks watching the Northwest basketball. Um, and I, I would love to see us just be more challenging defensively without fouling. And if we get blown by, we'll then teach that habit. Um, don't go the conservative approach and sit people at the basket because it's not the solution long-term for them. No, I'll just jump in. I'm sure Nate um, has something to add as well, but I actually really saw this yesterday on Twitter and it was really timely because I, I'd echo a lot of what you said there, Mark, about you know coaches and even athletes just not feeling comfortable enough to pressure the ball and... You know, as a result, we, we develop bad habits that won't help us go up levels. But I saw this on Twitter, and it's a quote from Paul Goris, who, you know, head coach at the, the Capitals in the WNBL. And he talks about, you know, when teaching junior players how to play when it comes to teaching defense, no help defense allowed. You have to be accountable for guarding your player. 
And I think that needs to be the mindset now. We wouldn't say like no help defense and like you're completely denying and all that. Yes, you have to have a bit of awareness of your positioning off the ball. But I think the message there is challenge yourself to get into the ball more and then you have to, to be able to keep the ball in front. So I think, um, you know, I've definitely been emphasizing more the last kind of three or four weeks of programming. And a couple of times what's happened is the player pressures it and the offensive player takes like one dribble. And there's been a couple of times where you hear a player yell like, help, help. So um, we yeah, got to challenge them to be better at guarding that player. I think some of the language that we've used in the past, um, and it's certainly part of uh, what's going to be in the Tasmanian Way document that we'll bring out later in the year and we'll present it to everybody, is the mindset of a defender needs to be, I don't need help. And he needs to build up that confidence in himself. For like He's telling his teammates coming out of timeouts, I don't need help. I've got... You know, I'll t- I've got this guy and I'll take on the challenge and responsibility. And if we can develop that mindset, knowing that you've got help built in, I think we can develop some really good um, resilient defenders. And, you know, for some, for some kids and some senior players, that might be their role. They might be, they're going to shoot the corner three and be, you know, the number one or two defender on the team. And that's how they're going to survive going through their basketball career. And I think a, a great example for a, for uh, state teams over my time has been Kobe Jackson. Hasn't been a skilled offensive player, has continually chipped away and worked at that. Um, but he was the best defender in the country. And his job offensively was get the ball from A to B, make sure the team is organised and you can take wide open threes. That's your role for now. Because that's actually going to help you survive and grow. And it got him a college scholarship and he's over there and, he wasn't going to play much his first year. They talked about him redshirting. He actually ended up starting like the last eight or 10 games on a team that did quite well. So he, he found his role early. That helped him survive. He did it to an elite level. And now he's, his career is, you know, it's up and going. So that, that might be some of your athletes that might not be as highly skilled, but they can be one of your team's best defenders. And that, that's a great role to play if that's going to get them court time and, allow them to keep loving the game. Just to add to what you guys have said already, in our Tasmanian way, we talk about our defensive goal being to make other teams score over us. And we want to do that through disrupting, through containing the ball and contesting shots. And so if we're teaching players to just get back and stand in a spot or not teaching them how to appropriately contain a gap, and contain the basketball, we're not achieving any of those goals what we're talking about. So really important that we're teaching the D. The other thing that you've both touched on briefly is that it does help the O. Like the O gets better when the D is working hard and we're competing and it helps the offense deal with pressure. And when you play at high levels and you go away to state champ- or national championships, there's teams that are high pressure teams and we are setting our kids up to fail if they can't deal with pressure. So having the D be ramped up and really coaching it at practice, and it does need to be coached. I had SDP boys this morning and we did um, shell drill. I only want to do it for a few minutes. Ended up doing it for 15 because it was poor early and we just had to like stay in it and really coach them to bring the effort and bring the juice to get something out of it. So it is a challenging thing to coach at times, but you just got to stay on top of it and help make them better. I think, I think also it's part of, and I know we talk about state teams and national championships and stuff because that's the space we work in, yeah. but it also might be helping someone in Division 3 get to Division 2. And then going from Division 2 to, well, the, now they've gone up to the Division 1 team because they're the best defender and they can make a really an open corner three. So they find their role and they can keep moving up levels from that standpoint as well. And, you know, we want all kids to be able to keep improving and, and be the best version of, of themselves. They don't ne- necessarily have to be a state player. We just want everybody in the state to be able to improve. And um, we think that this, this scenario of defending more aggressively without fouling and pressuring the basketball and learn to stay in front is certainly going to, Help enhance both O and D over coming into next rep season, especially. 
right, where we have longer preparation, um, have a chance to put your system in for your team uh, over a longer period of time. Something that just popped in my head as, as you were talking there, Nate, and, you know, when it comes to under 12s, very few of any under 12 players are capable of knocking down you know, an open three-point shot. And I think that's where, as coaches, we say, oh, they can't shoot free, so there's no need to pressure them. But like Nate was saying, it's pressure on the ball. It's good for the offense to be able to handle that pressure. But I think on the flip side, like defensive, where you want to pressure the ball so it makes it harder to pass. Because when someone's so up and tight and in you, it just takes away your vision. It makes that more difficult and obviously will make the offense better. But I think that's a really good way to look at it for under 12 athletes is you want to pressure the ball so it makes passing harder. It's not, you're not taking away the shot, you're taking away the passing. And I think that's, that's um, uh, yeah, one really good way to look at it for the younger age groups. Definitely, it's a great point. Um, just to finish up, if, if there's any questions, shoot them through. If not, um, fine. I just had a couple of notes as we were going through and we talked about our off-season um, non-dominant hand plan. The other thing, the, the unique skill to our sport is shooting. So just asking yourself some questions of how are you teaching shooting? What is your plan? If you have someone come to you and go, you know, can you take me away and help me with my shot? Um, so having some thoughts around how you're going to teach uh, your shooting technique, all right, and what your progression may be and some of the language you may use. And if, you, if you're at a point where you think, I really need some, you know, some help in that, um, then make sure you reach out to us because it is the one unique skill in our sport that we, we talk about. We need everybody to be able to shoot. By the time you get to 18s and 20s and going into whether it be NBL1 or off to college or just wanting to be a really good domestic player, like you have to be able to shoot, shoot the basketball. So how are you going to teach shooting and what's the progression going to be um, from that standpoint? And the last thing I'll leave you with is um, we've talked this week and I've put it in some of our Facebook groups, uh, private group chats of role models for kids. So within your team, talking about role models, most kids will look at uh, whether it be Opals or Boomers or someone in the NBA. But we've talked about role models actually being right next to you. And it was quite interesting when we talked to it tonight, the under 12 girls, one of the girls actually picked another girl in the team who she plays with and says, I look up to her as being a role model. You know, she trains really hard. She's a good teammate. She's a good person off the floor and had nothing to do with talent. And this child was quite talented, but um, it's under 12. So who knows where her career's going to go. But I think it's a good question to ask your kids before the season ends. Who's your role model? Who are you going to keep an eye on in the off season or watch that you can learn from? Uh, and because it, it might be someone, and most of the time it's someone either within your club that you can see more regularly to learn from where, you know, we all admire Paddy Mills, but we see him in a game on TV. We don't actually see him, you know, off the floor too much or, you know, around the local basketball stadium. So, that's something we're going to be pushing with the kids for this off season to who is your role model that you can, you can see on a regular basis. Uh, if we haven't got anything else. Uh, no questions. That's right. Someone had to go and pick their daughter up. So thanks gentlemen. All right. So no worries. Um, again, if we can help, uh, we want, we're going to have a little break with the zooms, but we'll, we want to continue on. Um, you're not too far down the track, but if you have any questions, anything we can help you with, right, don't hesitate to, to reach out.